Namaste, everyone, and welcome back to my channel. Thank you for tuning back in. Today, I have the pleasure and the honor to host a very special someone. And I'll tell you why I say special in just a bit. But first, I'd like to welcome him. Namaste, Baba Jibji, and uh, welcome to my channel. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to do this video with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam. It's my pleasure to be here <laughs> in your channel. All right. Wonderful. And um, so I say special because uh, you're somebody who um, I learn a lot from and that I get a lot of inspi uh, inspiration from. And just to give the viewers a little bit of introduction about you, I'm going to say a few words about you. Um, so Baba Diji is a um, Google Cloud engineer by profession but has over 20 years of experience in modern age spirituality and astrology. His dream is to rekindle and revive the um, lost wisdom of ancient scriptures and to share that um, wisdom with everyone, that timeless wisdom with everybody. Um, he has a YouTube channel called Exotic Astrology. I'll put the link to that in the description box below. You all must visit his channel and uh, check out all his videos. That's where I learn everything from. And, um, and his videos are mostly about spirituality, about self-development and astrology. Uh, he currently lives in Germany, where he has done his master's in IT and currently works in a firm there but is originally from Assam in India. So once again, very, very warm welcome. Thank you, and thank you <laughs> once again. <laughs> and we're going to dive into the subject. So we're going yes. to speak about spirituality today. Uh, and the first question is going to simply be, what is spirituality to you after all the experience that you have accumulated through the years and cultivated? Um, what is spirituality and also, you know, when I watch your videos, I see a lot of times you chant um, mantras, shlokas, verses from, uh, from scriptures, such as the Bhagavad Gita, for example. And that itself is, is a wow thing for me, because we see very, very little of that. And, and you're very young as well. So, you know, in the youth today, it, it, it's something that's very inspiring. That's why I wanted to do this video. But, you know, it's not only about saying those verse, verses in, in Sanskrit, but they, they seem to flow off the tip of your tongue. <laughs> and for me, you know, when some, something is like second nature to anybody, it, it automatically gives me two things, you know, it's commitment and dedication. It's commitment to learning and dedication to practicing what you learn. So how did your spirituality journey begin and on this path, you know, uh, your guru or gurus that you've had along the way, what, what's the importance of that guidance that you've had? Great. Uh, you had sent me a mail uh, with all the questions. I was very much inspired. And that, firstly, that, that gave me a vibe that you are a genuine uh, spiritual seeker and you are very inquisitive and enthusiastic and eager to find the truth, you know. <laughs> Uh, which is a which is a very important uh, quality which is mentioned in the Vedanta Sutra as it says, "Athato uh, Brahma Jigyasa," which means one should always inquire about the higher truth. So it's very rare to find uh, somebody inquiring so much. Now, having said that, uh, like I have spoken uh, about my journey in many places, but what I would like to say, if you ask me in context of spirituality, is uh, first, I would like to talk for two minutes about materialism. No, otherwise, <laughs> you can't understand what spirituality is. Uh, actually, I was born in a very uh, aristocratic family in Guwahati. And my grandfather, uh, he had uh, served as the IS officer in India, which is a very prestigious uh, uh, elite services for administration. It's from the government. Most of the Indians are aware. And my father has, had also been a very senior level bureaucrat as the commissioner and secretary. Now, why am I saying this? Because uh, these, when you are born to such a background, you, know, you are always uh, hovering around with the cream of the society. You, know? you see people who have reached the top of anything that you want. You see you know, actors, musicians, politicians, bureaucrats, teachers, 
and you you yourself have everything at your command at a just a phone and it's there you just call somebody and the secretary comes and he does it so when i was born in these uh, these kind of settings and i was always surrounded by all these people so then i saw that these people they had reached the pinnacle of what you say now success in material civilization they had everything they still have everything you know they have properties they have uh they have good marriages uh, not necessarily great for everybody but decent good marriages you know they have good parents they have good children they have anything which a normal person would aspire in life you know? not career wise it's family career all these things i had seen now having seen all these i saw something very interesting in the first 18 years of my life i saw that these people they have everything which we were also taught from school yes yes you must have this you know you must get a job you must get a, a wife you must have children you know you must have grandchildren you must have at least two properties you must have three vehicles and then at the end you will be happy it's like a destination obsession which every uh, each one of us uh, were put through you know okay when you are at the age of 15 you have to pass your 10th then you will be happy then you have to pass your 12th then you have to become an engineer then you have to you know get a job then you have to get married so it was like this destination uh, it's like milestones as the materialistic society portrays them to be so when i saw all these i saw people they have achieved all these things yet there was something which they didn't have in their life and that was happiness <laughs> so except yeah. this they had everything else i had seen the promise the fallacy of the material civilization that once you get all this you will be the happiest person you know there there is nobody who can uh, even check you counter you you know, you'll be the most happiest person so then when i started seeing these people i saw politicians especially you know trying to pull their opponents down they are they have a very big persona outside but when they come to my home i see they are fighting like animals in the dinner table why is it and then i was like these are the people who we are selecting as leaders <laughs> and uh, these are the people who have come to my home they have had dinner they have had lunch you know they have got all the nice things and then when uh, they are <laughs> with their friends you know i have seen how they behave huh? and so mm. then i started inquiring that uh, what what is that which they are missing in life why why is there so much obsession you know because they have everything there's nothing uh, even if their wealth uh, doubles or quadruples it will not make any difference in their life they will still be like this <laughs> right. even if it becomes 1/10th of what they have that will not affect their life in any way they have so much name fame so much but they lack happiness why is this so then i started uh, being inquisitive about different uh, religions because then there are only two ways you know one one is the material side and then you you hear from your childhood oh there's somebody called as god you know he's he's a big man out there you know he can give you whatever you want so then i i i was born into a hindu family so then of course he start with the uh, quote and quote the hindu scriptures you know like a uh, reading of the ramayana mahabharat and then bhagavad gita i was not very much inquisitive but i knew it was a conversation within the mahabharat so that's how it started uh, but the first 18 years of my life i i had done all self study then i had also gone inside you know different religions uh, like islam i had studied then christianity i have studied quite a bit a uh, bit of sikhism not so much on judaism i have studied and some facets of jainism and uh, buddhism quite similar to the vedic context so i had studied all this but then there was a uh, then there was a major challenge in front of me you know oh what's this all about there are this eight, uh, 18 puranas are there then there are four vedas and like itihasas are there one not eight upanishads are there wow and then i came to know that there are uh, it's like you know one lakh verses are there in all the vedic scriptures if you combine them one lakh i guess is 1/10th of a million right so uh, sorry not one one lakh the mahabharat alone is one lakh you know it's like the mahabharat alone it's not the total sorry it's only one book mahabharat it's the 
biggest uh, it's actually a poem as you would be aware and it, it's the biggest book in the world you know bigger than iliad odyssey combine all of these you know much more than that so then i was like this one book itself is so vast what about the other book you know shrimad bhagavatam there are 18000 verses bhagavad gita has 700 uh, shlokas and then ramayan has so many shlokas verses and then upanishads are there my god it's like so many and then you start reading all this but then it doesn't make sense because every book tells oh worship this god he is supreme okay go to this devata you will get this he'll get that and so there's a lot of material uh, incentives which i saw in the scriptures you know like if you want a good wife you go to this devata go to lord shiva and ask you know he will bless you with a good wife <laughs> something like this or if you want well then go to ganesh or go to kuber you know they will bless you with all this so then that was like a self study and then astrology also came along with it numerology came astronomy also came uh, but then yet i was uh, clueless about what's the conclusion because if you don't know the end then the means doesn't make sense you know <laughs> mm. and then i was lucky uh, in the year 2010 i had gone to chennai uh, to do my bachelor's at srm university and then when i went there i met so many gurus there from different uh, sampradays different traditions like uh, from the shri sampraday from gaudiya sampraday brahma madhva uh, madhva sampraday and then i uh, read under them so many things especially uh, the bhagavad gita and shrimad bhagavatam so when i read under them i understood what actually uh, it means to be spiritual because till that time i always used to think spirituality means you know something mental like uh, <laughs> people think spiritual means to you know just meditate and sit and you know you are feeling something you know that's being spiritual you know? like uh, one of my friend he was there you know he told i told him you know you should do some spiritual practices so then he told me yeah i also sit and think you know <laughs> <laughs> so so this this idea is there and once i went to a, a festival where there was a guru he was sitting and he was telling uh, there were like 10000 people he said everybody close your eyes now everybody pin drop silence close your eyes you know think that you are in front of a big mountain there is a nice river it's flowing <laughs> think that there are birds are chirping think there's beauty outside and then just think and meditate now come back open your eyes you know how was the spiritual experience so then uh, this 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 was my idea also you know imagine something have some weird feelings you know something unnatural happens that means something spiritual has happened you know? like i don't get sleep sometimes oh i have had awakening have you seen in us this world is very it's like a buzzword everybody is having an awakening these days you know <laughs> it's basically they are not getting sleep sometimes and they think that's like awakening so i was also like this but when i read uh, these scriptures uh, with these gurus and so many other personalities and then i visited so many uh, holy dhams within india now uh, like kanchipuram i visited tirupati and then when i went there i learned from the different sages there and then they taught me what actually is uh, spirituality spirituality is something which is totally beyond your mental physical emotional intellectual it's like a connection of the heart with god as the word yoga or yoga as it's famous these days you know? so and then i read up from the bhagavad gita that lord krishna speaks about different yoga systems you know? that yoga which is popularly known as yoga or yoga today that's what that's nothing but ashtang yoga basically no but then lord krishna goes higher he says first karma yoga then he says ashtang yoga gyan yoga then he culminates it into bhakti yoga so then i read the shrimad bhagavatam which was uh, written by the great sage vyas dev at the end of his spiritual maturity and then that uh, that scripture exclusively talks of pure spiritual knowledge you know? which is devoid of any material incentives like sometimes you read the vedas you will find as i said earlier oh worship lord shiva do this mantra 10000 times you will get a good wife you know, do this mantra 50000 times you will get a good son you know? <laughs> some like material incentives are there in the vedas so, like to bring people close to uh, spirituality but then bhagavad gita and shrimad bhagavatam these are two books 
which purely talk of connection between you and the super soul as lord krishna says in gita that you know i am there uh, in the heart as the super soul so how to connect to him how to connect to that parmatma what practices should you do so when i started learning all this and i started practicing and applying it into my life then i realized okay uh, spirituality means ac actually to connect to the divine and feel that divine experience uh, because otherwise it just uh, remains up to a mental level and uh, sometimes people think that okay this is spirituality that is spirituality but as they give the example if there's a bottle of honey you can see that bottle of honey <laughs> you can admire it you can wonder it you can dream about it you can uh, you can do whatever you want but if you want to experience honey there's only one way <laughs> you have to open that bottle and you have to drink it so right. otherwise you cannot experience what is honey so therefore uh, when we do spiritual practices which uh, are mentioned in our uh, esteemed scriptures like for example uh, for kali yuga this current age which, where we are situated it's the age of quarrel and hypocrisy now uh, the bhagavatam says the most important uh, path is the chanting of uh, god's names actually hari nama sankirtan as the bhagavatam says so therefore when you chant the names of god and then when you uh, there are so many processes nine processes of uh, spiritual upliftment which we can talk some other time but the point what i am trying to tell you here is when you connect to the gurus and as you asked me regarding gurus uh, it is very important that we now uh, we have some kind of guide who can actually tell us uh, how to go ahead in our spiritual journey because uh, these days people have this idea you know oh you don't need a guru you can just do everything yourself you know <laughs> so they are right and wrong also because where they are right is uh, you can study everything yourself you don't need a guru okay but what the guru does is the guru establish the guru's position in today's world people think guru is like a teacher you know he comes and sits and gives you some uh, knowledge and oh do this read this after this you read this and that's all but that's not the job of the guru the guru's main job is to establish your connection with god and whenever and wherever and whoever does any spiritual practice any sadhana we do it as an offering to the guru actually the guru offers those services on our behalf to god because the guru is a representative as lord krishna says in uh, gita na tad vidhi pranipate na pari prashne na sevaya krishna says that uh, render some seva some service and enquire humbly and then he says upadekshanti te gyanam gyanina stato darshina because they have actually seen the truth okay so therefore the guru is the one who is establishing your lost connection with god and he he is the one who offers everything so it's like uh, you want to meet the president of a country you can't meet it's impossible he or she is a very busy person but then they they have their secretary you know or you know somebody who is close to them so through them you can go right you can't just say oh i am so great you know the president of uh, my country will come and tell me hey sir madam i want to have a chat with you know nobody is that great it can happen but we have to be very great huh? so if if a president of a country uh, it's impossible for us to even meet that person in this lifetime so what to speak of uh, god almighty who is the controller of all the universes as the bhagavatam says in you know, sarva loka maheshwaram krishna also says that in the gita how can we uh, have that much purity and that much elevation within us that we can go and meet him and discuss uh, and have a one to one relation that is possible but uh, at our condition stage where we are currently we have so many impurities you know. so then it is next to impossible for us to connect to god we can do things artificially externally but that doesn't mean you have the connection so the guru is the one who establishes this connection that is the primary responsibility which happens when the guru gives you initiation diksha so when you take diksha under a guru then guru is the one who promises god that uh, oh god this person has uh, now promised me to do these many number of um, mantras or any set number of spiritual practices every day he or she is eager to develop a connection with you so i on his behalf or her behalf i am promising you that he will always do this and therefore please 
oh god for god's sake for your sake please help this person come close to you only then it is possible that we makes real spiritual progress otherwise all the progress that we make is in the mind only <laughs> it's not actually happening and now somebody may think okay i don't have a guru you know what, what will happen i don't get diksha i don't have diksha or something like this so then the answer is very simple it's not our job to find a guru we just have to be sincere and we have to pray sincerely to god then it is his job to send us a guru like he had sent for dhruva maharaj he had sent narad muni Na, uh, dhruva maharaj wanted to look for lord vishnu and then narad muni was told by lord vishnu that he he really wants to come to me so now go and <laughs> go and uh, get the job done and then narad muni came and gave him this mantra no? om namo bhagavate vasudevaya so therefore if we do not have a guru then we should pray to pray to krishna and then it is his job it's his duty it's his responsibility that he will send us a guru eventually and then by that we will make actual spiritual progress <laughs> wonderful wonderful thank you so much for sharing all this and um because we are from a uh, from a culture that that pays a lot of respect to gurus i i wish to just say this because not everybody who who would watch this um hail from the same country uh you know gurus go beyond the the subject knowledge like you said it's not simply a teacher it goes beyond subject knowledge and it's that um guiding force that guiding energy that gets you onto that path and guides you um and i and i read something yesterday and it said real teaching occurs when the disciple achieves some level of discipline and uh you know there is between this interaction guru shishya interaction um there is you know it, it goes deeper into the relationship where the shishya actually surrenders into the teaching so this brings me to the next question because you've spoken so much and so beautifully about this divine um divine energy that we want to connect with but in one of your um recent videos you also spoke about um atma gyan that connection to your own true identity and nature Okay of course you've already uh, spoken about the connection to the divine energy uh, or god or higher consciousness whatever one calls it but the connection to the inner in the identity and i think this is going to shed a, a little more light into what you said earlier about being empty in spite of having everything else still you know finding that there's some kind of void and and you know now it, i think is if there was ever a need to be more in tune or connected to the that true nature is now because in the last 12 months especially we've heard so much about mental health and a lot of this comes from this lack of i feel uh, correct me if i'm wrong but this lack of connection or uh, you know you just feel disconnected it's also a word that we hear a lot i just feel disconnected you know i don't know it just feel disconnected So can you tell us a little more about atma gyan and the the importance of connecting to the true self that self which which goes beyond what we're conditioned to believe we are or that we think we are Yeah so uh, first of all uh, I would like to clear this about atma gyan and you said you know and the divine consciousness about god so the example is given my shiksha guru had given a very beautiful example now we have this hand you take the right hand or the left hand <laughs> now somebody may like to eat chocolates or you know like he gave the example of gulab jamun but in canada people may not be aware so i am giving example of chocolates so imagine this hand develops a desire you know oh i want to eat eat some nice chocolate you know like in europe there are lint chocolates beautiful now is there any way that this hand can get that pleasure there is no way 